My name is Hilary Stolpen, and I started working on uh, seam in 1952. I started working on the Northern Pacific in Pasco, Washington, and at that time it, the Northern Pacific was 95% steam. I started working on the Sioux Line in 1953, and the tour that we're going to give right now on this locomotive, I worked on that in 19. 53 and uh, basically uh, I was on a passenger train going to Federal Dam which is uh, a halfway point to Superior and Duluth and I asked the engine watchman if he'd take a picture of me up in a locomotive and his name was Frank Drork and he says sure. So I went up on the locomotive and I leaned out on the fireman's window and he proceeded to take a picture of me, and then I asked the engineer, Siebert Beck, he was his name, I said, would you stand alongside of me, and we'll make another photo. And so that's what we did. And so the locomotive was a station here, and it was a locomotive station in Thief River for passenger service. So. Uh, very few locomotives went into passenger service. You had to have the seam hookup to go into each car because the seam would go through the car and that would give you heat in the winter time and uh, it, it'd have the valve cracked in the back and the seam would go through and basically uh, uh, that locomotive was stationed right here at Thief River. So. A steam locomotive has a number of features that they all have. That first dome that you see on the, where is on the front side of the locomotive, that's where they put the sand for the sandbox. And the sand would come down under the wheels so you'd have traction, otherwise they'd slip. And sometimes you'd be uh, on a railroad track that would be grass and the wind would be pushing the grass over and you'd have to put sanders on too. And the sanders would be on the, you can see them hanging on the wheels over there. And the next, the next dome that you see, that's called a throttle dome. And that's where all the steam would go to the top of that. And that's when the engineer would pull back on the throttle, the steam would click from there and go down to the driving wheels, to the pistons. Another thing about the wheels, when you look at the wheels, uh, the wheels had tires on them. And they could take those tires off because once in a while they'd have to take them off because you'd get flat spots, they wouldn't be round. So they'd have to put heat on, they'd have to jack up the locomotive, the wheels would drop down, and they'd put heat all the way around, and the uh, uh, steel tires would expand, and they'd take the tires off and re-grind them and put them back on when they're hot and when they cool off, they tighten up. And that's the way that the tires are fastened to the driving wheels. And uh, we got, uh, in the front of the locomotive, we got air compressors. And the air compressors are uh, steam powered and uh, they got pistons going back and forth and they create air. And uh, all the braking power on the train is air power. Another thing, when you look at the, on the steam locomotive, the whistles, there's actually three whistles up there. And you get three-part harmony. On a, on a diesel, it's just one big blare, but on a steam a locomotive, it's much more pleasant to listen to because it's a three-part harmony. If you look up at the whistle up there, you can see, you can see that uh, each one is a little higher than the other, so you get different sounds out of it. And on the side, you got the air tanks. And basically, uh, there's a generator on top in front of the whistle. And that's where you'd uh, uh, create electricity for your headlights. There's a regular generator up there. And so now we'll, uh, we'll go up to the cab now. Well, this is where I would be sitting here and uh, those pictures that were taken in 1959 is what I was doing. 
I was never an engineer on the ra on the Sioux line because I didn't have the seniority. When you work on a railroad, you start as a fireman, and you have to work three years as a fireman before you get get promoted to be a, an engineer. And in three years' time, they got rid of all the uh, locomotives. So, but basically, when you went to work, you'd have to start uh, checking your fire, and you you got a number of valves down in here, and what would these are air jet valves, and they're pointed different places. There, there's a stoker involved here, and there's an auger that goes underneath there, and basically it augers the coal and pushes it up on that apron, and these jets, they actually are pointing down, and they push the coal, and the fireman would have to get down, and he'd have to, have to get down and then look in here and see how it would be. And if you can take a light, can you take a light how big the firebox is in there? There's the firebox. It's about 15 feet long. And uh, you see there the flues there. All the steam goes out, the heat goes through all the, and there's there's water all the way around this jacket here. There's water here. Everything is enclosed water all the way around. And so the first thing you do, then you put the blower on. You do open up the blower, and that would, it's like an air bellows, and it would really blow up and it, it would really get the fire hot. And then here's a temperature gauge over here. And this steam locomotive would pop off at 175 pounds. So if you got over 175, there's a relief valve up here, and that would shoot the steam up into the atmosphere. So you can't get more than 175 pounds. When you are working, you try to keep that as close to 175 as you could. Here's a water glass right up in here. The engineer has a water glass. And the fireman has one. So you're watching that fire and you're looking at the pressure here and you're making sure that you have enough water in here. If you don't have enough water and you put in coal into a, a firebox and the water would be gone and then you put fresh water in there, it couldn't handle it and you'd blow up the whole boiler. and. You'd be absolutely, I've seen pictures of uh, boilers that blew up and all there's left is just the driving wheels. So if everybody was watching that water was very important. Make sure you had at least an uh, inch of water in the bottom. And basically, then you had a water injector here. Open this up and that would take water from the tender and put it right into the boiler. And over here, I'm going to show you the auger, and this is the and there's the auger that augers the coal, and that goes all the way underneath and it goes up into that pot over there. Once in a while, once in a while, you get clinkers in there, and you'd have to work them down. You take this bar, and you work this back and forth, and there's four sets of grates that open up and then sometimes they'd be real stiff and you'd have to take this pole here you'd have to take that pole and you'd have to try to break those clinkers and then work work these grates back and forth When you were working as a fireman, you didn't want to leave that firebox open, especially at night, because the engineer was sitting here, and if it was all lit up here, when the box would open up, that was white hot in there. So you'd step on this lever right here. There's a lever on the floor. You'd step on that lever, and then the air would shoot that open. And if you, if, if you had a hand bomber, this locomotive is a stoker, but I worked on hand bombers, 
and there you'd have to shovel coal. And what you'd have to do what you'd have to do is get the coal and then you step on this lever here and that would shoot the door open and you'd hit over here step on that lever and you'd, that'd be your job and you'd have sometimes a whole tender full of coal up there but every 30 miles 40 miles you'd have to stop and pick up coal at a, a coaling station when you were working and I'll show you some things on the engineers control here this is a throttle and when the engineer would pull this back it would start putting more seam into the pistons and Basically, that valve goes all the way up to that throttle dome that's on top of the locomotive, and that's where all the steam uh, is actually gathered. A uh, steam locomotive works like a, a kettle. You're boiling water, and steam rises to the top, and that's where you'd want to pick up uh, your steam. You wouldn't want to pick up uh, too close to the water, because you can't, if you got water into the boiler uh, and into the piston, they would uh, ruin the piston, so you just have to pick up the seam as high as you could. And this is called a Johnson bar over here. This is a reverser. And if you're going to start a train, you push it all the way forward. It's like putting it low. And to be efficient, when you start getting faster and faster, you try to get it just about centered here. And basically, the engineer would be watching, and if it was real efficient, uh, it's just about right down to the center. It was a very efficient, if you had it all the way down. If an engineer didn't like a fireman and he was shoveling coal, all he had to do to get even with him was just leave the Johnson bar a little further forward. That would do the job. Uh, this is the train brakes right here. And this uh, sets all the brakes on the whole train. These are the engine brakes. So this just puts the brakes on the power. Say you're moving the engine around, this is what you'd be using here. These are the sanders. You press this button here, going forward, back. And basically, once in a while, uh, you, you'd have to use this uh, if the track was slippery, if there was grass on the track, and uh, et cetera. And sometimes even uh, dew on the, gra on the track would make it slippery. And uh, this, this would be what the engineer was looking at right here. And these are lub lubricating the, uh, the pistons, so uh, oil goes up. So there's a, there's a glass in there, so you can see the, how much oil is going into the... So the engineer would be working with this to make sure. And of course, this is, this is a whistle, and the bell would be... There's a bell cord. The only thing that works on this locomotive is the bell. I'm going to ring it right now. A number of years ago, that bell hadn't been rung for over 50 years. And I went up and I got some uh, lubrication and uh, I took it apart and lubricated and we, we got the bell to work. So when I give tours uh, to anybody, uh, especially when they have kids, they just love to ring that bell. So basically, uh, that's more or less about all I can tell you. As I mentioned before, uh, there's water all the way around that boiler. And uh, once in a while, uh, they'd have to take and clean all the flues on this locomotive. And uh, every, every day, the engineer would make a, a log report and go into the roundhouse, and the machinist would grab that, and he'd fix anything that was uh, on there that to be fixed. And uh, when I first started working, it was 16 hours a day. And then they changed the federal law that you couldn't be on the road for over 14 hours for a few years. And now they have it set at 12 hours. So anybody that's working on a, a locomotive train now, uh, they can only work 12 hours a day. When we were going in passenger service, the conductor would give signals to the engineer 
and it would be called communicating whistle signals. And basically it was right over his head, right over here. And basically uh, uh, two whistles would be go ahead, three would be to back up. Uh, they'd have different numbers. Seven would be to shut the boiler uh, steam to uh, the coaches. And so they had all kinds of different signals. So the engineer, uh, would, some of the signals would signify to the engineer that he'd have to uh, stop at the next passenger sa uh, station. Another thing that was very important when you were going on the road, uh, if you had to meet on another train at a certain town, uh, you had to make sure that everybody understood where you're going to be going. Because if you didn't, you'd have a corn, cornhole meet someplace. So uh, be when you left the last station before the meet, the conductor would give the signal to the engineer. And if the engineer didn't give a, a communicating s signal that he heard the whistle in the cab, then the conductor would put the train into emergency and stop and ask him why it wasn't done. So anyway, so that's, that was a very important feature. This, this is a steam uh, hookup. This hooks up to the next coach and this goes from one coach to the other all the way back to the train. And this is where the steam would be keeping the cars warm and in the summertime it would be air conditioned. This, this would be the air brake hose. And this goes all the way to the last car and all the air for the air brakes goes through here. This hose is the one that's the communicating uh, hose and this is the one that the conductor would notify the engineer where to stop, what to do, where to meet other trains and etc. Basically, knuckle, if you're going to make a joint, and the other one that hit here, lock. And and to open it here. Well, thanks for uh, uh, listening to me, and uh, it was uh, a pleasure to work uh, on steam power. Uh, when I was working on steam power, the time would go by so fast, and uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You got real dirty doing it. You'd have to shower every day after you got off work, and etc. But it was a very interesting and challenging job and uh, I hope you enjoyed listening to me.